All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Sarah Lawson. I am an enrolled citizen of the Iowa tribe of Kansas and Nebraska and a board member of the National Tribal Land Association. I'm also an attorney with Schwabi Williamson and Wyatt, and so I'm here to introduce uh, my colleague at the firm, Jeff Cohan, who is going to be speaking on implementing the Hearth Act. Um, if you are an attorney and you need CLE credit, there is a form up here at the front of the room um, that you'll need to sign up uh, for the CLE credit. Um, and if you have questions, please use the microphone at the center of the room so that we can make sure that we capture your question on the recording. And with that, I will turn it over to Jeff. Good morning. This is uh, talking about implement implementing the Hearth Act. Um, the uh, presentation, if you want a copy of it, you can come up and sign up on this pad in the front next to the uh, CLE sign-in. Uh, or leave your business card, and we'll email it out to you. Um, and if you'd like uh, to ask questions, like Sarah said, use the, please use the microphone, but also um, I'm happy to answer questions as we go along. So, so the Hearth Act um, is an amendment to the Long-Term Leasing Act, Long-Term Indian Land Leasing Act. The, um, as uh, any of you know who have been uh, looking at it, you know, it's changed a lot over the last uh, umpteen years. Um, there's a progression from, um, you know, long-term leasing under the uh, under the Act of 25 years or 99 years, to uh, opening it wide open to um, first several tribes from Washington State to do their own um, to return to them the ability to lease their land out on their own without BIA approval, and then that was extended to the Navajo Nation in 2000. Um, and eventually to all tribes that wanted to adopt the uh, adopt regulations under the Hearth Act in 2012. The, um, as the name suggests, you know, some of the impetus behind it was to encourage uh, home ownership um, on leased land. The, uh, um, not going to read the whole title, uh, you can read it. The, basics of the Hearth Act are that it, uh, first of all, it authorizes uh, tribes to enact their own regulations under it. And the term regulation is not a mistake. The act um, essentially says that, uh, you know, here's a federal act and tribes can act, enact their own regulations that implement that act. So it's the same sort of uh, um, hierarchy that you have with a statute, you know, a federal statute that then is implemented by BIA regulations. In this case, uh, instead of the BIA, you have uh, tribes. Uh, but make no mistake about it, you're still talking about enacting a tribal law. So when I say, uh, um, you know, Hearth Act regulations in this presentation, what I'm talking about is a law, a code, an ordinance passed by a tribe. Um, under the Hearth Act, the leases are not subject to uh, federal approval anymore, um, and that is the main uh, uh, attractiveness of the Act. The term of years was also extended for all tribes, so that uh, most leases are extended to can be extended to 75 years, flat out. So residential leases. Um, the religious, public, educational, so forth, but you know the main thing is residential for this purpose. And uh, of note, business and agricultural leases are only allowed to be 25 years with two renewals. So in effect, 75 years, but with two opportunities to say no. Um, in addition, for uh, wind, solar resource uh, uh, leases and for uh, wind devaluation leases, the BIA has imposed the limits that are in um, Part 162, which were not in the statute. There is, you know, the important exclusions from the uh, from the Act are, uh, first of all, um, exploration, development, extraction of any mineral resources. So that is a very large exclusion for uh, energy resource tribes. Um, you still have to deal with the uh, cumbersome process of BIA approval for those types of leases. Uh, I would say, though, that for uh, use of natural resources for any other type of lease, uh, 
Um, those are included in Hearth Act. Um, another important exclusion is the leases of individually owned Indian and allotted land. Um, and that's probably uh, an obvious uh, reason why the federal, tr federal trust responsibility extends not just to tribes but to the individual members. And so um, the ability of a tribe to then you know, control uh, or approve leases on behalf of its members would interfere with the federal government's uh, view of its trust responsibility, which is to stand in between uh, individual tribal members and the rest of the world and say what is better for them. So that may change sometime, um, but for now, uh, individual uh, leases still have to be approved by the BIA. Um, I added here at the end, uh, BIA also, you know, through a um, bit of sleight of hand, added in that uh, fractionated lands cannot be uh, subject to Hearth Act le leasing. So if a tribe owns a fraction, an undivided interest in a uh, piece of property, the uh, BIA says that that can't be subject to a Hearth Act lease. Um, this seems to have arisen from discussions about uh, acts about, not acts, but uh, pieces of land held by both tribes and individual uh, Indians so that the, um, the bar against allotments uh, was thought to apply also to fractionated lands and now has been extended to cover uh, fractionated lands where a tribe owns a fraction of an interest and an, an individual Indian may not even own an interest. And that, um, I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but um, you can see why that is a, that can be a significant uh, um, obstacle. The federal role under the act is mostly to approve the tribe's regulations, and there's only two, um, two requirements for approving those regulations. The first is that they be consistent with regulations under um, 415A, which is the Long-Term Indian Leasing Act, which BIA has interpreted to mean all of parts 162. And I think that's debatable, but there it is. Um, the other, the other, only other uh, statutory requirement is that the tribes provide an environmental review process, which we'll go into a little bit more in a minute. The other parts of the federal role continuing on under the Hearth Act after approval is that the um, tribes may defer leases to uh, the BIA to approve under Part 162. Um, this in, will help with uh, overload in uh, tribal land offices. Um, it also means that there's essentially sets up a two-class system where um, perhaps the most important leases will be processed by the tribal office and less important ones have to wait in line at the BIA office. There's also uh, discretionary federal enforcement of tribal leases, so that if uh, tribal enforcement is not successful, um, you can try to bring in the feds, it's up to them whether to come in. And then finally, the most uh, problematic of these is the federal oversight of the tribe by the federal government. So um, the compliance of the tribe with its own regulations is monitored, uh, not monitored, but is uh, uh, taken into account by the federal government in certain times when there are appeals from um, actions of the tribe under the, uh, under the Hearth Act regulations. And that, again, I'll talk about more in detail in a moment. So talking about federal oversight in more detail, um, in order to carry out the trust responsibility, the federal government has deemed that it's important for tribes to supply um, all of the lease information to the federal government so it can be recorded in the uh, land title records office. The, um, also, that all direct payments to the tribes have to be documented. That's something that's been added by BIA. So that if at some point the, uh, uh, there's a matter of enforcement um, or there's a question of whether the tribe is uh, uh, carrying out its regulations, the BIA can then look to see whether the, B whether the tribe has been actually receiving its uh, direct payments. The, um, you know, 
the, as far as enforcement goes, the, there are only a couple of tools here. The, uh, the federal government can um, either, infor uh, at the behest of a tribe, come in and try to enforce the lease against the lessee, or it can cancel the lease. Um, and I've quoted this part, upon reasonable notice from the applicable Indian tribe, which indicates that this is at the tribe's behest, not simply at uh, BIA's behest. Although, I would not doubt that BIA takes the position that it, has, it can go ahead and enforce um, leases based on what I was talking about before, about the uh, trust, this view of the trust responsibility, and it's, monitor, you know, it's taking monitoring the uh, lease documents and the acceptance of uh, direct payments. Um, finally, the federal oversight includes enforcement of tribal regulations against the tribe. Um, this would happen in a case where uh, there's been a, a disappointed lessee or a lessee uh, who has, uh, you know, allegedly violated a lease or that things like that where they have appealed. Um, if there is a tribal process, they have to exhaust the tribal process. If there's no tribal process or if they have exhausted the tribal process, then they can petition to the Secretary of the Interior. The, um, the definition of an interested party, um, unlike interested party under Part 162, um, an interested party is a where it, they have to have some financial interest or direct interest in the lease. Um, an interested party can mean an Indian or non-Indian individual, corporation, tribal or non-tribal government whose interests could be adversely affected by a tribal trust land leasing decision. So that means that um, you know, th those who are uh, opposed to a lease being let other than the uh, lessee, who of course is happy to have the lease, um, could, in theory, petition the Secretary of the Interior after, um, after appealing through the tribal process. Um, now, the hammer here is that the Secretary may take any action to remedy a violation of the, and in this case, this isn't a violation of leases, this is a violation of the Hearth Act regulations themselves, so we're talking about the tribe here. They can take any action, it, it's undefined, by either the, fed, by the, either the uh, congressional statute or by the uh, guidelines that BIA has published. Um, but the, uh, you know, the severe uh, remedy, uh, after the undefined ones, the severe remedy is simply to rescind approval of the tribal regulations, which would mean then that the Hearth Act regulations are no longer effective and you go back to uh, all leases having to be approved by the BIA. Now, in addition to that, there's the, uh, in addition to the leasing process, there has to be an environmental review process. Um, some of these, uh, you know, folks who are familiar with NEPO will see some familiar words in it. The, uh, the, uh, whether there are, it has to evaluate whether there are any significant effects on the environment, um, ensure that the public is informed, uh, and ensure that there are responses to comments. But that's it. Uh, this, so if you're familiar with NEPA, this is a much, much abbreviated version of NEPA. Uh, also, the view of what the public is is not the same as what the view of the public would be under NEPA, where it's wide open. The public instead can be just the folks who are uh, in the nearby vicinity who are actually affected by the lease. Um, you know, notices can be published in uh, tribal newspapers rather than going to newspapers of general circulation in the nearest town, things like that. There's also the ability that if this process, if this lease involves a federal approval and there is an actual NEPA document, uh, the tribe may rely on that and simply skip the environmental review process. So if there is a, uh, for instance, you know, if you have a uh, 404 permit or dredge and fill permit under the Clean Water Act, or you have a, an NIGC action that triggers NEPA, you can uh, rely upon that environmental document rather than going through this process. Um, that said, 
you know, the, uh, particularly I'm familiar with tribes in California because I'm a California lawyer, also now a Washington lawyer, it turns out, uh, <laughs> keep forgetting. The, um, but, you know, tribes in California were all uh, required by the, the uh, compact process to set up a TEIRs, or Tribal Environmental Reviews, which can also then be opened up. It's plenty of uh, process, probably more process than is needed for the Hearth Act uh, environmental review process. So, has BIA issued regulations? No, it hasn't. It's issued guidance. Um, and for lawyers, this is, uh, you know, this is sort of the angels on the head of a pin thing um, because the guidance is essentially treated as regulations. Um, there's really no percentage in trying to challenge it and say, well, they're not regulations, they're not binding on us because guidance is only binding upon BIA employees um, because if you try that, uh, you'll wind up with your Hearth Act regulations getting slowed down to a stop and then, you know, perhaps uh, disapproved because they don't, because BI just doesn't know how else to, um, you know, the BI uh, employees have to follow the guidance. The guidance says you have to have these things. So um, they, are, they are essentially regulations. And I've listed um, the one, uh, the major piece of guidance is uh, 52 Indian Affairs Manual number 13. Um, that's available on the website. It's also on a link at the end of this presentation. And uh, just a reminder, if you want this presentation, there's a sign-up sheet. The um, one thing that a lot of folks uh, use and that the BIA staff use in, in evaluating tribal regulations is the sample checklist. Uh, there's also a flowchart which when I get to the, uh, pr the procedures for approval of tribal regulations, you'll see why a flowchart would be nice and why I should have included it in this uh, presentation. Um, as far as the pros and cons, so, you know, as I said, you know, because they're regulations and they're not binding on the public, they're only binding on BIA employees. Um, they're quick and as you'll see in a minute, they're relatively simple. Uh, I say relatively because they're not as simple as the statute could have made them. And, uh, but the troubling thing about guidance is because it wasn't issued uh, subject to notice and comment rulemaking, it can be changed uh, with the administration. It can be even changed during an administration. So, adoption of Hearth Act regulations. Um, I wouldn't uh, presume to tell any tribe how it should go about adopting the Hearth Act regulations uh, or any uh, law, tribal law, but uh, what I have uh, suggested to my clients in the past is that you start with the folks who know about leasing, uh, you start with the models that the, uh, that the BIA has, pub it has published models, it has also published every single set of Hearth Act regulations that it's approved on its website and you can look to those. Um, go through legal counsel at some point. That seems like a good idea. Um, and then tribal counsel and tribal membership and then rinse and repeat because I've never seen one of these uh, just go through one time. I've never seen any tribal law just go through one time. Um, another thing is to try to keep it as simple as possible. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but basically, um, you don't want to throw in extraneous things that BIA can then approve and then hold against the tribe or that BIA then has to approve any amendments to. So just talking about the relative simplicity, um, this is the entirety of the federal statute, uh, what the f entirety of what the federal statute has to say about the process for approval. Basically, uh, you send in your application and 120 days later, the BIA has to decide, or the Secretary of the Interior, um, which has now been delegated to the BIA, uh, has to decide whether they're approvable or disapproved. And um, the deadline can only be extended after consultation with the tribe. Uh, BIA, of course, has changed that a little bit. Um, there are five, pa in uh, 52 IAM 13, there's five pages of procedures. And I'll go over a simplified version of that in a minute. 
Um, they also draw out the 120-day clock by requiring that uh, you know, they only act on originals, they only act on signed documents, they only act on effective documents. Uh, so the clock only starts when they get the original of your, of your ordinance law uh, resolution. It pauses as soon as it's the tribe's turn to look at uh, um, two modifications that are suggested. And then it resumes again once uh, BIA has it. So they get a little more than 120 days, um, at least 150. The, um, also, rather than, uh, on the substantive side, rather than simply going with what's consistent with the leasing regulations, they've thrown in basically every uh, important part of Part 162 into the requirements. Um, and the uh, Indian Affairs Manual has 10 pages of substantive requirements um, to replace what Congress said about them just being consistent. So, this is the uh, stripped down, simplified version of the B typical BIA process. First, there's the submission, as I mentioned. Um, it has to be the original of the act, ordinance, statute, whatever, you, uh, whatever your tribe calls its codes. Um, there has to be an original, it has to be original, signed, and effective. So it has to be in, in and this is an odd thing because BIA is demanding that it be effective, but also uh, notes that they can only be effective upon secretarial approval. Um, Find, and it also has to have an original of a cover letter, um, which is just them, you know, just being very particular. And it has to be accompanied by a signed resolution. Although I had a client who didn't uh, pass ordinances by resolution, so they didn't, they went ahead and accepted it without a signed resolution. Um, first, there's the initial review, which is basically the Harthak consultant out of uh, uh, main DOI's uh, realty office, um, then the solicitor's office, uh, central office of the solicitor in DC. Uh, they examined the Hearth Act regulations uh, based on the checklist and uh, 52 IAM 13. They also, there's an option for the regional uh, realty officer to comment on your Hearth Act regulations as well. Um, not always taken and uh, they're not required. Um, then there's uh, an internal process in between the initial review and when the comments go to the tribe. During those 20 days, they do internal processes to uh, consolidate their comments and you know try to speak with one voice. Then there's a uh, the there's the uh, uh, comments go to the tribe. The clock may stop there or may stop once they have the uh, conference call. It's not. A, I don't think that they have. Uh, they haven't treated my clients entirely the same on this. And then um, once there's the conference call with the tribe, that's when the clock is supposed to stop. Um, and then it's up to the tribe then to take on the modifications suggested by BIA, and I say suggested because really um, BIA treats them as a requirement. Uh, and then you have 30 days to get the modifications back to BIA uh, if you don't, uh, it goes down the track to disapproval. If you don't do the modifications, it goes down the track to disapproval. Um, and then there's the, um, once they've gone through the modified submission, it then goes through the same, um, the realty goes to real estate, it goes to the solicitor's office, and then if it's approvable, they ask for a final version and then the final submission happens, and then it goes through the surname process and so forth to the assistant secretary. Um, potential pitfall is, of course, that you miss the 30 days. Um, I don't think that that has been an issue, uh, that a tribe just missing the 30 days leads to a disapproval, but that's something to watch out for. Um, I'm not going to, I decided to spare you going through all of the substantive requirements for Hearth Act regulations because um, I wanted some of you to be left at the end to ask questions. The, um, 
basically, the, this is the, these are the headlines from the checklist that BIA uses. And uh, what I would say is that um, basically they've used every part of part 162 and uh, every major part of 162. I would um, ask that if any of you find a part of, uh, or a provision within part 162 that is not included in the requirements that uh, BIA has promulgated in its guidance, uh, let me know. Um, I'd like to, I, I would actually genuinely like to know that because it does appear that they've basically taken consistency to mean uh, similar to or, um, and that is from based on the guidance. Now I'll get to the variety of different uh, tribal regulations that have been um, approved. Uh, none of these requirements are in the statute and, um, or necessarily required for consistency, so you don't need to copy them. Um, and of course, if the uh, models that are provided by BIA or one of the uh, uh, other tribal sets of regulations that are published um, make sense to your tribe, um, feel free to use them. There's no reason you have to div uh, di diverge from those just because uh, you need to be independent. You can, if they answer your needs, um, it, so much the better, it will go through that much smoother. But know that if they don't meet your needs, uh, you do have the freedom to change how those are, how those are, and you don't have to follow 162. Um, but as a practical matter, you do have to follow the uh, um, the requirements in the Indian Affairs Manual and in the uh, checklist. We'll get to some um, inconsistencies between the two in a minute. But um, yeah, this could have been a lot worse. They could have just said take Part 162 and be um, as strict as Part 162. They rejected based on legislative history a meets or exceeds standard, so we didn't end up with that. Um, they also could have imported, which they did not, um, BIA not being necessarily a friend of NEPA to begin with, um, did not decide to import a lot of NEPA uh, requirements that they could have uh, into the, you know, based upon how much they imported into the substantive requirements for the Hearth Act regulations, they could have imported quite a lot of environmental procedures into uh, the environmental side of things, and they didn't do that. So um, could have been worse. And um, frankly, it's, you know, uh, having been through the process a few times, it's, it's not really that bad. Um, so these are some of the changes that BIA made to the Hearth Act between um, Congress's enactment of it and uh, their issuance of guidance. Um, so these have developed mostly in the first couple of years, but some of them over the last 10 years. Um, I mentioned uh, these first three already. Uh, regulations cannot apply that land that is fractionated. Now this is one of the differences I'll show in a second between this and the checklist. Um, under the Indian Affairs Manual, the, um, the land that is fractionated and it held in undivided interest by the tribe and an individual Indian cannot be subject to the Hearth Act. The checklist just says it has to be 100% uh, owned and no fractionation. The, um, so if this is important to you, for instance, I know of a tribe here in Southern California, whose casino is on uh, fractionated land, or he was on fractionated land, that could be a significant obstacle. And so it would be important to uh, figure out whether you wanted to go challenge the BIA on the fractionation point, because there is room to do that. Uh, wind and solar leases, wind energy evaluation leases, I mentioned before, uh, shorter than what was provided by Congress, because Congress just left it wide open everything but ag and business leases was supposed to be up to 75 years. Um, finally, the, uh, this is a, probably a good idea, but a little bit uh, uh, picky. The tribe will provide the BIA copies of all leases and lease documents, and lease documents is uh, uh, defined to include leases, assignments, leasehold mortgages, etc. So uh, the devil's in the detail with the et cetera. The, um, obviously, if they want to, uh, if one wants to make sure that the uh, LTRO is up to date, 
that um, you know you have the proper uh, land status um, uh, recorded, which is important to both the tribe and the BIA. Uh, you'll want to have all and any document that encumbers the land needs to be uh, uh, recorded by BIA. Now the um, you know there are often uh, associated with leases. There are often business um, uh, agreements that go along with them uh, or are included within the text of the lease itself. Um, if those have confidential uh, information in them, you may want to leave those apart, have them as separate agreements not encumbering the land. What happens if the tribe does not provide the BIA those documents, leases, mortgages? What happens? Well, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> Because I, I, you know, the way that the act and the guidelines would have it is that um, you know somebody, an interested, any interested person, could then uh, you know take that up with the tribal appeal process if they found out that these documents weren't being recorded, could take it up with the tribal appeal process and then petition the secretary of the interior to, uh, and the secretary of the interior, as I mentioned earlier, has the uh, ability to take any action, quote unquote, the, uh, to remedy the situation or to rescind the regulations. So my guess is that what sh would happen is that if these, uh, you know, if the documents were not kept up to date and this became a problem, that um, you know you'd have to go through exhaustive tribal mem remedies, and then go to the Secretary of the Interior if that didn't fix it, and um, then the Secretary of the Interior. Uh, sh would probably not want to rescind the regulations, but would try to take other um, undefined remedies before that, such as leaning heavily on the tribe. Um, you know, the, uh, because the statute doesn't give the, uh, the breadth of the remedies, and the remedies haven't been, um, haven't been defined by regulation by BIA, it's hard to say what those could be. Um, there isn't, for instance, a hook to start withholding um, uh, funds from the, uh, from the tribe uh, based on this act. Uh, you could, you know, perhaps if the tribe has contracted realty, uh, you know, uh, realty functions, there could be something there where the uh, feds might have a hook, would have a hook, if the tribe were not recording uh, documents properly. Um, but that's a very good question. For renewal terms, um, instead of um, at the end of each 20, we want to do a 75 year lease instead of it at the end of each 25 year term. Um, is there anything prohibiting us renewing each term just by notice instead of a mutual agreement between the tribe? No. Um, and do you, is there, I guess this is more of a, policy, but is there anything that during the term of the lease that the ownership of, of the improvements should not be owned by the lessee or the sub lessee? Um, should, does the nation have to own that? Um, and then um, if, if the project, if we're not being required to build, um, is there any reason why we need to have a, a, a bond for that? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, okay. wouldn't we want a waiver of that bond? So. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, uh, you asked first about uh, renewals, and uh, no, there's not whether renewal could just be by notice, or uh, you know, it could also just be by the inverse of a lack of notice. Um, there isn't anything requiring that uh, it be by any particular process, but they the. the um, that's the sort of thing that should be in your uh, Hearth Act regulations, and if it's not in the Hearth Act regulations, it's a very good idea to have it in the lease, because that's a, a uh, subject of a lot of dispute um, in leases. The uh, as far as ownership of the interests, uh, the improvements rather, so buildings and so forth that are uh, constructed on the leasehold land, um, that's one of the things that uh, is imported from Part 162 that has to be uh, addressed or is strongly, it, I can't remember now whether it has to be, has to be addressed or is strongly rec recommended that it be addressed. Uh, 
I think it has to be addressed by the uh, Hearth Act regulations, and the you know the, not. Uh, not the actual disposition of the improvement. The improvements can either be, um, you know, granted to the uh, lessee, or revert to the ownership of the tribe at the end of the lease term. Um, just needs to be addressed one way or the other, uh, which is also, um, you know, in leases that haven't done that in the past, that is a has been a, a wide arena for um, for litigation, both on reservation and off reservation. Um, and as far as a bond, uh, there have to be, um, they, they have to address the bond requirements. Um, so that was, um, I can't count the number of bullets, it's one of the bullets there. Um, bond provisions have to be addressed, they don't have to be required. So um, if there isn't, if, if a bond makes sense in a particular lease, you can require a bond. If not, then it's not required. This is left up to the tribe's uh, d uh, up to the tribe's discretion, and this is part of the overall uh, one of the, you know the first advantage when I get to that slide of the of the Hearth Act is the fact that the tribe finally gets to make its own decisions about its best interests and what to what to require and what to leave aside out of Part 162 rather than the BIA having the final say about a bond. It's now up to the tribe. Yes. Mm -hmm. I am here to speak as an individual uh, that used to work for the BIA. Um, actually, I was the Hearth, Hearth Act coordinator for a Great. few years. You should and be up here. <laughs> it's all I can do to keep my mouth shut because, and I'm not obviously keeping it shut. All right, I was there when the original checklist came about. That original checklist was requested by tribes not to impose additional restrictions on them. It was requested by tribes to say, hey, if we're going to do this, what kind of things should we put in our leases? What are we looking at? So what was a good example, typically that had gone through Indian country, was 162. And what can we put in there? So it was a checklist to say, these are some of the things that are typically in the leases. Use them if you want. They're not all mandatory. There were some things mandatory, like the NEPA process that you explained very well, um, for what my two cents is worth, right? But I am just really, I have a lot of friends in the BIA. I'm a citizen of the Choctaw Nation. I have a lot of tribal friends. Um, I want to see the best of both worlds if, there's, if that's possible. But I'm really upset to see that now all these things that used to be discretionary are mandatory. It's like, I'm about to go. So all I wanted to say to the tribes, all right, I always recommend a good relationship with your agency and region if you can have it. You can go so much further with that. And I know that we think that's impossible, but you can have it. I've seen it happen. But the other thing I'm going to say is don't take this sitting down. If they're telling you that you have to go by and comply with everything, you make sure that you really need to do it. You are writing these regulations for your lands, your reservation. Congress passed the Hearth Act with just how many provisions does it have in it? You know, I've forgotten now. It's, it's been a few years. Now. But, you know, and the solicitors I worked with there and the BIA people I worked with there when I was, and I was working out at D.C. at the time, we were about deferring to the tribe whenever we could. I'm so sad to see this. I'm really sad. I know good people are still working on it. But take it back. It's the Hearth Act. Take the darn thing back, okay? So if it means sitting down with BIA and having a measured conversation about, you know, well, you're saying, and I don't know what the whole wind and solar thing happened. You know, how did that happen? Um, you know, just talk to them. What truly is mandatory and what is it they would like to see you do? And that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> and I, I've been sitting here, you've done, you're doing a great presentation and you've got everything in there as far, you know, you know a lot more about it than I do now, right? But it's, that's the part that's upsetting me is that I'm seeing what's actually happened. And um, if this is the reality, 
as tribes, we need to get together, we need to talk about it. And remember, I'm saying that as an individual. I'm not representing either a tribe I work for or my own tribe even. This is me speaking, and so no one else should suffer any repercussions for me having a big mouth. Okay, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much. No, I'm glad that you uh, you had that to say. It's uh, you know it comports with what I a lot of what I was going to say at the end, um, and it's a, it is important to keep in mind what the intent of the act was. Yes. Uh, uh, good morning, uh, Pablo Padilla here. I'm not a BIA employee. Um, I'm I'm an I'm, where, I'm, I'm, I'm I'm an Indian lawyer. I'll be speaking at 1:30 in this room. Hopefully, you guys can come. Uh, my my question has to do so with the heart that came out. I was representing a few Indian tribes. We're from the southwest in New Mexico, Pueblo country. And um, the tribes were really excited because the impetus, at least from our standpoint in the southwest, was that uh, the BIA was taking way too long to approve these. So we're going to get to do them. Uh, of the four Indian tribes that I helped navigate through, uh, none of them uh, were able to meet the challenges that were expected in the regulations. I guess my question is, uh, question and a comment. Uh, the question is, uh, this is a classic uh, example of an Indian tribe taking over a federal function, you know, Indian self-determination, that kind of things. Does the BIA provide any resources other than the 638 to Realty um, funding in order for the tribe to assume this function? And then the comment I have is, um, what, uh, I guess it is a question, and that is, what about recordation? You know, the TAM system that the BIA uses um, if a tribe takes this over, do they have to have their own system and do they have to sort of integrate the data that comes from their own recordation with the BIA's trust responsibility to record in Pueblo country? Okay. Um, so with regard to the, the first question about um, aid to tribes to uh, run these programs, um, the statute includes that uh, BIA is authorized to give technical assistance to tribes, and that may come in the form of 638 contracts. Um, the uh, contracting for realty services under 638 would give tribes the ability to do um, most of the BIA function, basically re you know, reporting the leases to themselves. They still have to then send the uh, leases and lease documents to BIA to be scanned and uploaded. Um, and then to produce the title uh, status report. But that's, you know, so those, those functions can still, you know, that, that provides an augmentation to uh, the tribal leasing process. Um, you know, so the, the tribes can actually take over some of the BIA process outside of, the, what's, outside of what's required by the Hearth Act. The Hearth Act itself, the, um, the decision has been made that um, actions under the Hearth Act are not federal actions and therefore um, are not um, uh, eligible for 638 contracting. So that's one of the things I was going to hit on at the end is that there's, you know, um, there's a staff issue um, because you need to anticipate that you're probably going to need to have more staff at the tribe. You're also going to have to find the resources to pay that staff outside of 638 contracting. So. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, let's see. Those were great questions and I really appreciate them. And um, so as, uh, you know, I didn't catch your name, but as you said, you know, the checklist can be uh, quite useful. Um, but it has, in fact, accreted a lot, you know, gained a lot of these requirements. And um, so I don't, you know, whatever it started out as, it's become, you know, there is definitely the word requirement used over and over again in it. And um, then there's an additional layer of issues, which is that between the um, Indian Affairs Manual and uh, the checklist, there are some inconsistencies. So I mentioned the, the first one before, which is this question of fractionated land. Um, there's also a, uh, a provision that seems to suggest that state law applies to all agricultural leases and that that must be addressed in uh, the tribe's Hearth Act regulations. That's not, in fact, the case. If the tribe wants to take advantage of state application of law, then it can do that. Um, there's also uh, misspelling. There's the inclusion of a severalty provision, which 
is basically, this is another lawyer issue. Um, we're not talking about severalty, we're talking about severability, so that uh, you want to make sure that your Hearth Act regulations, if any part of them is ruled to be inapplicable by a court of competent jurisdiction, that the rest of it will stay in place rather than it being uh, all going down in flames at the same time. Um, severalty has to do with liability or with ownership, not with the way that you interpret a, a, uh, um, an ordinance. Um, also, they've slipped in that rent payments may not be accepted more than one year in advance, which is something that I understand why BIA doesn't want to do it, but this is something that a tribe could want to do, um, and there's nothing in the act or the, that seems to mean that they shouldn't be able to do that. Um, also, finally, and most pr uh, sort of troubling, is that it appears to grant uh, BIA or right of entry to inspect the premises. And this is different from the Indian Affairs Manual. In the in Indian Affairs Manual, the right of entry is conditioned upon reasonable notice by the tribe. So this is presumably at the tribe's request. So, um, you know, it, it's important to, as you're using, even though the checklist is a very useful tool, uh, be sure to, um, you know, make sure that the things that it's requiring, if you don't like them, that you make sure that there is a basis for them in the statute. Uh, or in, you know, in the, uh, at least in the Indian Affairs Manual. So the, um, after approval of regulations. So this is the uh, end of the process uh, for the federal side of things. After the, after the regulations have been approved, that um, after they've gone through the uh, three different um, uh, re revisions to the uh, Hearth Act regulations and have sent them for approval to the uh, Assistant Secretary, the Assistant Secretary signs off on them, publishes them, then um, leases no longer require BI approval. Um, BI will encode the lease documents into TAMs unless it's um, um, contracted out and then forward the uh, title uh, status report to the tribe. So, now we talk a little bit about the uh, variety of uh, the Hearth Act regulations themselves. Uh, the first one is a, a pet peeve of mine. Um, there's a lot of these Hearth Act regulations on the website that just simply launch into the regulations themselves rather than saying where to find things. and. Um, you know, you should do your future selves and you know, uh, future em tribal employees a, uh, a, a service as, along with you know, future legal counsel uh, and put in a table of contents. It's not, not too difficult. Um, the, uh, most of them follow a model. Um, I did not follow back to the beginning to see what the earliest tribe was that did that model. That's just too much work, frankly. Um, so I don't, I, I didn't ask BIA exactly which tribe came up with that model. They probably wouldn't tell me. Um, but then the next most just track part 162, which I think is fine for those tribes that want to do it that way, that want the cumbersome process of part 162 because they like process, because they want to ensure that everybody sees fairness and to be ensure that everybody's comfortable. So, you know, lessees, uh, uh, who have experience in Indian country are more comfortable with Part 62 than they would be with newly invented Tribal Hearth Act regulations. So that may work for a lot of tribes. Um, but uh, the, ra and the remainder vary. So, uh, you know, there's not a, uh, you know, the model probably accounts for uh, half or a more majority, and then the rest um, fall into those other two categories. Um, for purposes of, uh, you know, if you want to look at a wide variety of uh, examples, um, I didn't put it on this sheet, but uh, I can read them to you. There's Morongo, uh, Pachanga, Northern Cheyenne, Laguna, and Isleta del Sur. Um, so those, if you look at those uh, uh, six, um, no, I can't count, five. Uh, that gives you a good flavor of the range of options in uh, uh, Hearth Act regulations. 
Um, some of the elements that change a lot from regulation to regulation, notwithstanding what I said before about them, you know, a lot being modeled on the model on the model, a lot of them being based upon the model or based upon uh, Part 162, um, even those have a fair amount of, rate of uh, uh, individuality in some of the uh, provisions. So uh, one of them, um, the biggest one, is scope. So a lot of tribes choose to just do business or just do residential leases. Um, there's also a wide variety in the definitions, which is one of the things that is a requirement of the uh, BIA guidelines is that you uh, define a set of terms that they've listed and that you set, define them basically as they've listed them. Um, and so you find um, you know, differences between, uh, I think Pachangas has around 20 definitions, some other ones have 80 definitions, um, and uh, you know, basically what Pachanga did was look at just exactly the ones that BIA said and did only those. Um, there's other things like competitive bidding and uh, negotiation processes. Uh, for those, you uh, might want to look at uh, um, well, I'm blanking on it, but now. But anyway, there are uh, ones with negotiation processes and competitive bidding, and I'll talk about why those are a bit of a concern in a moment. Um, the environmental process, uh, some tribes have chosen to import their uh, pre-existing tribal environmental process. Um, like here in California, the TEIR processes for some tribes, uh, the, uh, or, you know, that are required of all tribes under the compact. The, um, the other range of options is that uh, within the environmental process, tribes can define categorical exclusions which are a really important way of saying, here are a category of leases that just don't need environmental review because they're not going to have significant environmental effects. Um, for instance, uh, uh, Pachanga says that uh, residential leases under five acres, five acres and less, uh, are subject to a categorical exclusion. So those residential leases don't, um, don't go through the environmental process at all. Uh, other ones have smaller, um, you know, five acres seems to be a fairly popular uh, limit uh, among the uh, Hearth Act regulations. Uh, some of them have ground disturbing uh, uh, thresholds for uh, categorical exclusions and others don't have categorical exclusions at all, which, um, you know, I would use categorical exclusions in, if I were drafting them. Um, but you can also just have what a lot of, uh, of tribes have, which is, that the uh, leasing uh, entity, whether it's a, um, a commission, a committee, or an individual, that the person responsible for that is, has the ability to say whether this is a project that has significant environmental effects or not, and then exempt it from the uh, environmental review process if it doesn't. Uh, rights of appeal, we talked a little bit about that uh, before. Um, it's important to have rights of appeal so that the first stop for a uh, uh, disgruntled lessee is, or somebody who is disgruntled by the granting of a lease is uh, not the Secretary of the Interior. Um, and taxation is uh, another area that varies quite a lot. So rights of appeal can be, um, you know, range from a few days uh, and simply one layer, so maybe the leasing office or can add multiple layers like a court and a court of appeal um, and may grant uh, a statute of limitations anywhere from 30 days to, actually there's one I think that's 15 days, all the way up to a year. Um, taxation, uh, generally the uh, way that tribes handle the taxation issue is to uh, reaffirm that uh, tribal leasing decisions, that tribal leases are not subject to local and state taxation, but are subject to tribal taxation. So, I'm sorry, so the, the no BIA problem. ruling in, two, was that, that was 2015, that said that um, Hearth Act leases and activities conducted under Hearth Act are exempt from state taxation. Is that still, um, is that still valid? I mean, has that been challenged or? Yeah, no, Hearth Act um, leases should be exempt from taxation just like, uh, you know, I think most um, leases of, you know, uh, 
most leases approved by the BAA should as well. I mean, what you have that's different in the preemption analysis for uh, Hearth Act leases is that you don't, you know, the, the BIA approval, the federal approval came significantly before uh, procedurally or in time before the actual lease decision. So it wouldn't be the same kind of federal and tribal preemption analysis. It would be slightly, slightly different. Um, it should be basically the same though um, because you still have federal oversight you still have federal control of the field, and you still have uh, you know, significant tribal interests. And in this case, the tri whereas the federal interest may have fallen a little, the tribal interest has gone up right. because it's the tribe's own Hearth Act regulations. So you th w uh, in that context, if there was a sublease um, uh, that was uh, entered into with a, you know, a third party developer, mm -hmm. um, you know, non-tribal, it's not tribally owned or anything like that. It's just, it's a third party developer for like a gas station or something. Those transactions and those activities under that use would be exempt from state taxation? Uh, well, it's going to depend on the preemption analysis, but yeah, it's going, they should be. I mean, the, one of the th interesting things about part 162 is that, you know, BIA tried to, uh, under the Obama administration, made this play to say that um, all leases are exempt from state and local taxation, which that position they abandoned in litigation in the 11th Circuit and in the 9th Circuit. And both those circuits said it comes back down to, uh, to just to Bracker preemption analysis. Okay. So, um, but I think it should still be the same in generally, you know, the tribal and federal interests should be significant enough to preempt. Okay, thanks. So, to answer your question? Yeah, I, I think so. I, it, it's just is you know, um, for instance, when they the, the state would amend its law to put the legal incidence of the tax on the oh, consumer. Oh sure. Yeah, well, and there's lots of ways that the state and the tribe could play this game against each other. The tribe, you know, can include all the purposes for which the uh, lease, all, all the purposes for which the lease income is being uh, used and make sure that those are all tribal um, self-determination related interests or economic development related interests. And then the state can also then try to tax something other than the leasehold itself. It can try to tax an activity of a non-Indian and, and try to you know, use the lease payment as the quantum of what's being taxed. And you can play these games back and forth, but I think that in the end, you know, like in the, uh, I can't remember the name of the case, but in the 11th Circuit, you know, there was a lot of, you know, this was a utility right-of-way um, case, and it was a question of whether they were, you know, whether it was leasing a, uh, you know, whether the leasehold in that case was uh, the same as the land, and they found that it was, which mm -hmm. is the basic, um, you know, uh, black letter law at this point. Right. So. so a few slides back, I saw that there, one of the, Pinky parts was ag leases being subjected to state law or state interpretation of how ag leases are administered. Um, I'm kind of interested in how that reconciles with the American Indian Ag Resource Management Act and if a tribe has adopted an ag resource management plan that specifically has provisions about how ag leases are to be administered, how that would reconcile with a, another provision um, that would fall under Hearth Act applications. So I know IARMA predates and is kind of like a precursor to the Hearth Act. So I was just wondering how those would potentially reconcile because the ARMP is a vehicle for tribal sovereignty um, over complete ag land leasing decision making options. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that the it doesn't reconcile very well, uh, and I don't think that it's necessary for tribes to adopt that uh, regulation that says that. Uh, it would be subject to state court uh, interpretation. There are significant advantages to using state courts if you don't have a tribal court, um, because state courts have jurisdiction over, uh, you know, pretty much any contract that, uh, uh, but the, whereas federal courts don't generally have jurisdiction over basic contracts. So the, um, you know, as for how it fits with IARMA, I haven't, to tell you the truth, I haven't practiced, done anything with IARMA for about 10 years, so I would be, 
Uh, it would be irresponsible for me to be talking about it, really. Um, but you know, as far as the Hearth Act regulations go, uh, you know, it's up to the tribe whether it wants to uh, import that. It just needs to not be tripped up by the difference in the wording between the checklist and the Indian Affairs Manual. So, um, lest anybody think I'm not a fan of the Hearth Act, I am. Um, it has uh, huge advantages. And uh, you know, if you can overcome some of the challenges that I'll talk about in a minute, the, uh, it leaves the first and most important one is it leaves the best interest of the tribe to the tribe to determine, both as a matter of what's written into the act, or into the regulations, and as, as how it's implemented. Um, there's less interference with tribal authority overall, so no nitpicking by the BIA about whether this term or that term really falls into line. It's just the tribe gets to interpret its regulations. The tribe gets to interpret whether its lease meets those regulations. Um, approval of Hearth Act regulations, notwithstanding my griping about the 120-day uh, clock coming and going, um, is still pretty quick. It's quicker to get Hearth Act regulations uh, adopted or approved than it is to get a lot of leases done. Um, so again, on the time side of things, uh, you know, the tribe, a pro you know, a properly staffed tribe um, would be able to approve leases in a few weeks instead of a year or more. Uh, you still need BIA, as we mentioned before, to do some of the uh, LTRO stuff. Um, and appeals are to the tribe instead of going through 25 CFR Part 2, which is an excruciatingly long process. Um, the tribal courts, tribal uh, appeals to a commission or tribal appeals to a decision maker or tribal council, all of those can happen much faster and remove the uh, cloud on the uh, lease. Um, streamlined environmental review is not just great because it's faster and narrower in scope. It's also important because uh, for big projects, NEPA is one of the ways that uh, outsiders use to try to stop the project. So um, with making this a tribal only process and requiring that any sorts of appeals, if any from the uh, environmental review process go through the tribe, um, you avoid that issue of somebody hauling you into, tr into federal court to, or rather hauling the BIA into federal court to figure out whether they have complied with NEPA or not. Now, of course, I can't be all of a booster. Um, there are concerns about it doctrinally. Um, this is a federal tribal pri hybrid, um, and it's not just granting tribes to freely, um, you know, uh, freely uh, lease their own lands. So the, uh, the term that a lot of folks in BIA like to use is to return leasing authority to the tribes. It hasn't done that completely um, because of all these requirements that are set on it. But it's uh, you know it's still better than what it, what, what came before. Um, trust responsibility. Uh, I'm going to just skip over this fairly quickly. Just that it's you know because there's less federal involvement, um, there's less federal liability. The intrusive federal investigation and oversight um, is the flip side of that. So the the feds are at least um, you know not disclaiming the trust responsibility but then they're using it as a uh, sword rather than a shield. Um, more concerns. Uh, in the enforcement of the Hearth Act regulations against the tribe, the, the BIA, or you know, Interior technically, has the explicit authority to interpret tribal law now and to say whether the tribe has complied with it. Um, there's the uh, taxability of leasehold interests that Eric talked about, asked about. Um, in my view, the bottom line is it shouldn't change. Um, the exclusion of fractionated land can be an issue for, uh, you know, particularly if that piece of land that's fractionated has a, uh, your major in economic development project on it. Um, then there's a question hanging out there about, uh, you know, if the BIA decides to cancel a lease after the tribe has uh, has asked it to, or even without the tribe asking it to, if you take uh, if you take a uh, more stringent interpretation, or uh, more liberal interpretation, I should say, um, then 
would the tribe then be open to, have, if it has waived its sovereign immunity in the lease, and the lease is canceled by another party, does the, does the tribe uh, become liable for that, for BIA's action? Um, so something that should be addressed in the regs. Um, important considerations. Uh, you know, it's important to um, define uh, tribal priorities in the, uh, in the best interest section of your uh, best interest of the tribe uh, definition or section of your Hearth Act regulations because that gives you the basis for determining whether to approve or disapprove a lease. Uh, you also, in order to have flexibility, need to have uh, some decision maker who will be able to override that and say, well, that's usually the best interest of the tribe, but in this case, no. Um, and I believe that's pretty self-evident, but if you have questions, please ask. The uh, tribal appeals uh, to prevent BIA being the first stop, I've talked about that a couple of times. Um, it's important, though, also for another reason that I forgot to mention, which is that uh, having a uh, well-understood appeal process ahead of time uh, makes uh, non-tribal lessees uh, more comfortable with leases rather than not having a sense of what you do if you disagree with the administration of the lease. Um, enforcement as well, if it's clear what the enforcement is, um, you know, that the tribe will be enforcing, that it's not depending upon BIA, and that uh, its remedies are the following. And you can choose any set of remedies that you want. I've listed a couple of them there. Uh, damages, ejectment, uh, ownership of improvements, things like that should be ad addressed by enforcement provisions. The, uh, it when I was talking to Eric, we talked about preemption of state and local taxes. Um, it's also, you know, just to put your lessees on notice, it's important to note to them that uh, they will be subject to future uh, tribal taxes, if any, if that is in your plans, uh, or it could be in your plans. Um, you don't want to be in a situation where the, uh, um, your lessee cries breach of contract because you've added uh, tax taxes to their uh, uh, in addition to their leasehold payments. When we talked about uh, the Bracker, the balancing and the um, you know, weighing in favor of tribal interests, um, a tribal tax, do you see that as something that also supports the argument that, yes. that the tribe's interests are, are being, you know, they're outweighing the states? Right. Um, and then is there like a vehicle that you think that captures that? Um, you know, if there's a, there's a tribal tax, but also, I mean, if you would implement like a, um, a special improvement district over the property or, um, under the lease, un, you know, pursuant to tribal law, those, those kinds of, I guess, tactics to use to maybe help further um, uh, weigh in favor of the tribal interest here. Yeah, well, I mean, that's not actually a question, is not it? I mean, <laughs> that's, uh, that's stated very well. That's exactly uh, what you can do to buttress the uh, preemption analysis and the, uh, in the applicability of a tribal tax is uh, you know, set up, for instance, you were talking about a special improvement district, that supports the, um, you know, that supports the argument that the uh, tribal tax uh, is, support, is supporting the tribe's self-determination okay. and its economic development more so than just simply saying, here is a tax okay. and this is what we use it for. All right. Thank so, you. Uh, Eric will be available for uh, questions afterwards. So, so. Um, on the environmental process, I have uh, you know, emphasized how much I like the streamlining of it. Uh, there's another, uh, uh, in addition to you know, the streamlining through categorical exclusion and keeping the process fast, you also uh, need to consider whether to, uh, and this is something that can be done just by discretion or it can be done in regulations, the uh, whether to have a more fulsome process because uh, for one thing you know if you don't have one if you have a uh, very stripped down environmental process it may be difficult for instance for a uh, utility um, that wants to come and uh, build on a right-of-way on the reservation or in a leased land to then tier what's called tier off of your uh, environmental impact statement so that if it's so if it's not um, 
if it's not robust enough, then they may be, not be able to do that and then have to do their own, you know, go through the full process of doing their own environmental impact statement, which can slow things down. Um, it also can uh, uh, impress lessees with the, um, you know, because an environmental impact statement doesn't, doesn't just talk about, you know, what the, um, but the impacts are, it talks about the, uh, in, you know, the physical location and it talks about uh, what's available there in terms of uh, utilities and so forth. So it can also provide a good document to show to, um, you know, developers to say, look, we've considered all of these things. This is part of our plan for uh, development. Um, now, I mentioned before about um, you know competitive bidding and negotiation processes are great things, and there's a lot of other great ideas for what to put in your leasing regulations. I would encourage you not to put them into them in, into the Hearth Act regulations, but enact them as a second code, so that um, you know because competitive bidding and uh, negotiation processes are not required by the BIA. Um, don't, they don't need to be in the Hearth Act regulations. And the advantage of not having them in the Hearth Act regulations is that any substantive changes to the regulations have to go back to BIA for approval. So if you throw in something that is not part of the Hearth Act uh, you know, requirements, then arguably if you change it, even though it's not under the Hearth Act, it may, you know, there may be an argument that you have to go back to BIA to approve that amendment. There's also an argument that it doesn't, shouldn't apply to things that are outside the Hearth Act at all, but that's difficult to see unless you set aside part of your act under a section that's called non-Hearth Act considerations or something like that, which I, you know, I would uh, support, but I wouldn't support as strongly as having two leasing, um, uh, two leasing acts, one that governs the uh, Hearth Act uh, set of considerations and then one that is an add-on that considers all the other tribal considerations that are, don't need to be approved by BIA. Uh, finally, think about including all kinds of leases. It's not that much work, extra work to add it. And um, you know it'll be there later. You don't have to process all leases that come in through the door in the tribal office. You can defer some of them or all of them uh, to the BIA. Now this is what uh, we were talking about a little bit earlier about practical challenges. Uh, the biggest practical challenge that I've heard from tribes is the uh, issue of staff time. And um, you know, in a lot of cases, tribes have uh, land staff or leasing staff and uh, then think, okay, well, we'll just go ahead and start doing this and don't realize uh, how much work goes into uh, you know, reviewing these leases and approving them and uh, you know, then overburdens their poor staff. So um, that comes down to staff time, staff training, um, and also the cost of uh, hiring new staff to cover it. Now, you know, theoretically, if your, lease, your leases are coming through faster and more efficiently, uh, you should have more income to pay for more staff, but it's a little bit of a chicken and egg thing. Um, also, because the uh, feds will no longer be funding a 638 program, if that's what you've been depending upon, then the, tri the tribal staff's time working on tribal leases uh, won't be compensable. There's also um, one thing that has come up a fair amount is the comfort of non-tribal parties with the lease process. So as you probably know um, from experience, you know, non-tribal parties are often suspect of the BIA process or just wary of it because they don't understand it. Um, that uh, phenomenon is even more pronounced when you're dealing with a uh, tribal-only program. So, uh, for instance, uh, potential lessees who have gotten used to or are just getting used to the idea of having BIA have to approve their lease and go through that process and have to wait for months or a year for that to happen um, now they're looking at the tribe doing it and wondering, well, if the tribe had to go through BIA before, and there's also this, you know, the widespread under, uh, false understanding that tribes have to get BIA approval for everything, um, it makes, you know, some lessees a little more, a little less comfortable. Um, the, 
the only solution to that is just more education. Um, show them this presentation, show them the act, uh, go through that sort of thing, get your uh, legal counsel to explain to them, that, you know, send them a letter representing that, uh, you know, the Hearth Act has been, Hearth Act regulations have been approved and cite to the, where they're published on the uh, BIA's website. Um, there's also concerns about tribal enforcement, which is uh, basically a racist issue. Um, the idea that tribal enforcement will not be fair. Uh, and that's, again, an education issue. Um, and then finally, there's one that's not, uh, not necessarily an education issue. It's more of a uh, uh, more regulatory, which is the difficulty in obtaining uh, commercial and uh, residential lending. Um, what I've heard from folks is that there's a lot of hesitance on the part of uh, banks and other institutions to lend on leases that have been approved by tribes. I don't know if that's your experience, but um, that's, the, uh, uh, that's one of the questions. It's also, you know, in some cases, it's a little more than discomfort because uh, the, say, under uh, Section 184 of mortgages, uh, they require that you use this, you know, specific forms and follow specific, uh, sorry, that you follow specific practices. So, um, you know, those, if you're doing particularly residential leases, that's something to look at is to make sure that it's compliant with the uh, 184 program. Um, and now I am done. So uh, if you have any questions, um, you know, I'm free. I'm, not, I'm free. You're free to ask them now. Uh, you can come up to the front, or uh, and don't forget if you're a lawyer to sign in. Um, please uh, do the reviews that Brenda's handing out, and if you want a copy of this uh, presentation, uh, including these uh, helpful links, so you don't have to read them off your phone, um, just leave me your note, your uh, uh, name and email address, and uh, or your. Uh, business card. Thanks. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm with the Bureau. Just for clarification, a couple of things. Uh, are options immediately exercisable? Somebody's making a major investment, has to have guaranteed longer than 25 years. Can they still use the Hearth Act and know that they've got a guaranteed long term? Yes. Yeah, you yeah. can make that, make that part of your regulations? That would be a good idea. Or the idea lease to, itself. Yeah. Okay. Um, as far as enforceability, is okay. If tr if a developer wants bureau approval to ensure they go to federal court to enforce, I know that was one of your last points. Could they get a federal approval without triggering all the other federal requirements like NEPA? Um, I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch that. As if a developer wants a bureau approval, oh. just so they know they can enforce in federal court, um, can they get it more of a they're, you know, technical, get a bureau approval without having to enforce all the other federal requirements? Uh, I'm not sure that the bureau would be comfortable doing that. I think that the, uh, the best bet for getting comfort would be to have a, uh, you know, higher legal counsel that would uh, give an opinion. Um, because, you know, the, you're, you're basically asking for is a legal opinion, and the solicitor's office, as we know, is very cagey about that sort of thing. So. Yeah. Um, do you think the environmental lobby at some point is going to sue, either say the approval of the federal regular regulations is a federal action that triggers NEPA even if the, even if the leases don't? Um, I wouldn't be surprised if the, uh, you know, for instance, if you had a tribe grant a lease for something controversial and the uh, federal approval of the Hearth Act regulations had happened within the statute of limitations of the uh, Administrative Procedure Act, then yeah, they could um, then say, well, this was a foreseeable impact, and therefore um, should have been, you know, the approval should have been subject to NEPA. And I don't think that would win, is, but wind and solar is a good example. I think it seems to me somebody is going to at some point, um, you know, want to intervene in something like that and claim that NEPA had to be met at some point. So. Yeah, no, I it think, would be a creative way of thing. trying to challenge it, but it, it would take a one more step than usual. But yeah, I could see that. Okay. And enforceability by the Bureau only for the tribe and not against the tribe. That's the way I would assume, right? Uh, yeah, the enforceability of a lease um, 
the, it wouldn't make sense for the tribe to be appealing to the Bureau for enforcement of the lease since they have that in their control. Um, as far as enforceability of the regulations, so if a disgruntled lessee um, comes to the Secretary of Interior with a petition, then that would be, that's the only part that goes against the tribe. Okay. So. And last thing, compare Section 17 with Hearth Act. Okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, the original beginning of my presentation uh, said this is one of the few areas where you can get to um, tribal leasing without um, secretarial or BIA approval. One of the other ones, one of the other methods would be to uh, incorporate a Section 17. Section 17s can lease trust land for up to 25 years, um, so not as long as under the Hearth Act. But that is another method that doesn't go through the Hearth Act and doesn't have, in that case, uh, Section 17s are subject to none of Part 162 or subject to none of the guidelines. They can simply lease as any other corporation would. So much freer in one hand, but shorter term. Yes. I'm going to try to, this is more just comment and information. Okay. I'm a BIA employee. I am not representing the BIA at this moment. I'm only speaking on behalf of the Pacific region. So some of the things that, one of the things that I hate to say but have to say is just a reminder that the fee simple title owner is the United States. So when you talked about the access to the property by BIA and it's not, it's frowned upon, so to speak, that's the reality. The fee simple title owner is the United States. The BIA is the delegated authority that has jurisdictional responsibilities. And so that's kind of what we have to do. So fair or unfair, that's the world that we live in. Um, the fractionally owned interests by tribes. We're, even if, this kind of I think comes through from the land buyback program. While tribes are through the land buyback program or even through probate, at sell at probate are getting fractional interest, they are still allotments. They were created and established as allotments. So while the Hearth Act does not apply to allotments, that's why it's not gonna, it's not gonna apply to a fractionated interest that a tribe may have on an allotment. That's still an allotment. Even if the tribe is to obtain 100% interest, which doesn't often happen under land buyback or anything else, it's still an allotment. That's how that property was established. That's how that title was established. Um, as far as the review of Hearth Act regulations, when you go through the review process, I stand with Cynthia on the, I have to be careful how I say this, but there is an overreaching that happens. And just keep in mind through that process that the solicitors and the Hearth Act coordinator and potentially your regional realty officer or your agency realty officer that's involved in the review process, there are like three levels of suggestions, suggested changes that are made. Keep in mind some of those are suggested changes. They go from something like suggested, recommended, strongly recommended, and required. So watch what level of recommendation it is that the solicitor's office and the BIA is placing on the changes that they're requesting or requiring when going through the review process of your Hearth Act regulations. And I think the last thing I have to say is that when it comes to funding, the unfortunate thing is that BIA is drastically underfunded and it's only tribes who can go and lobby for additional funding. When a tribe 638 contracts or compacts the real estate services program or and or the LTRO program, there is funding that comes from the BIA that trickles down to the tribe under that contract or compact. BIA is underfunded, the tribe's underfunded. That's the reality of it. Um, but there was a question that was placed that I don't think was answered correctly that, or maybe not even answered, but if a tribe contracts the LTRO function, they are required still to use the TAMS system. They will be provided government-owned equipment. They have, their employees have to go through the same background procedures that our employees have to go through in order to be able to gain that TAMS access. But they do, even if they have their own tribal land data system, 
they're still required to use the TAM system um, to, because TAMS is the system of record. Again, the United States is the fee simple title holder and responsible for all that record keeping that has to be done in TAMS. Okay. Um, thank you for that. I think that, uh, you know, respectfully disagree on a couple points, but uh, overall, yeah, I you know, appreciate your, uh, um, uh, both your point of view and the facts that you've given us. The, I certainly didn't do, intend to um, say that the tribe's record system would replace TAMS. Uh, if that was what I said, then I did misspeak. Um, as for the right of entry, my point about it was that uh, BIA has to have a source of authority as a federal agency, and I just you know, respectfully disagree that, that, that there's just a general right to enter. Um, the, uh, there's also uh, the question about fractionated land always being an allotment. Um, I think I would argue with you about that. So, but I understand the, uh, the basis for that, and I understand your reasoning. And it's certainly uh, um, arguable that you're right. Yes. I'm oh, sorry, I had one more. No uh, problem. Can you grandfather an old lease and operate under the Hearth Act for future actions? I'm sorry, say it again? Can you grandfather an old lease, pre existing BI approved lease, and take no. subsequent actions, including amendments, assignments, amendments, so forth? Use the Hearth Act for those? When they come up for renewal, then you could probably use the Hearth Act, but it would be technically a new lease. But okay. the old leases continue on for their own term. Okay. With so. the consent of the parties, they could do a replacement lease and use the Hearth Act, right? Yeah. Okay. Yep. okay, thanks. Hi, Hi. again. Um, as a lender, your perfect example. Legal advice, how do we, we're working with tribes that have the Hearth Act, they're providing us their leases, Mm -hmm. and they're providing us the legal descriptions that we're using for the mortgages, the 184, how do we verify that that legal description is correct before we close? We're finding out after we've closed that BIA is rejecting the mortgage and or the lease because the legal description's wrong. Right. Well, the, uh, I would suggest that uh, you request that, you're talking about uh, individual uh, individuals, so they would then be able to request. You're talking. I mean, you're talking about 184 mortgages, right? So you're yes, talking sir. about individuals with leases of tribal land. Yes. And um, then they would. They should be able to request the legal description from the BIA, or um, more to the point, your point. Um, you, you, they should have legal counsel look at the legal description and uh, you know offer up an opinion on that, so that it's less likely to conflict. With what, with how BIA would uh, describe it when it gets to BIA's desk. But so, sh hmm. we we should be asking for the legal approval then for the for the lease and the. But isn't that no? I'm just talking about getting uh, a legal opinion on what the uh, legal uh, description should look like, rather than a uh, you know I think what you're what you heard me say was to go to the BIA and get approval. Um, that would be nice if we could, no. um, and if you have a relationship with them that allows you to do that, that's great. But as an outside lender, you wouldn't be in that position. So that's why I'm saying you go through um, the borrower to seek the uh, information uh, if it's a particular lot that has already been described by BIA, or if it's a new lot, go to legal, outside legal counsel and try to get a, a uh, legal description that's going to pass muster with the BIA. Hmm. That would be my approach. But it, I can see from your face that you don't agree. Who's paying for that? We, <laughs> that's my thing. Is that, do yeah, we charge no, the tribal member? Then right. go, oh, okay, we need to add that on? Or are we supposed to pay for that? I, that's, that's what my face was, was like, well, yeah, that's another no, fee. It's, it's an unfortunate thing that be, you know, in Indian country, a lot of things require legal counsel that don't necessarily yeah. require legal counsel outside of it. And that's a, uh, you know, there are, uh, you know, sources, um, you know, nonprofit sources of uh, legal advice. I don't know that that would be, that would be the, um, you know, the borrower would be going to them, not you, but uh, okay. Thank that's you. a potential. So. Thank you. 
Hi, thank you for letting me come up again. But anyway, I'm a little confused with this act um, and want to know how we apply this to Alaska because we obviously don't have reservations. We have native allotments. And if no, this does, doesn't apply to native allotments, no. uh, I mean, it's kind of confusing. Yeah, no, unfortunately, the Hearth Act would only apply to those couple of pieces of, uh, I think there's four or five pieces of tribal trust land now in Alaska. Uh, outside of uh, Metlakatla. Um, oh. So it wouldn't apply to individual allotments <clears throat> and it wouldn't apply to um, fee land, which is how, you know, uh, the villages and corporations, tend, when they own land, they own it in fee. Outside of the villages and corporations, our, our native allotments are trust lands. Yes, they're right. Yes, they individu we individually own them, so. Right. This doesn't apply to our individual native trust no. lands. No, it doesn't. The, your tribe would not be able to lease your land, would not be able to s approve a lease of your land. You still have to go to BIA. BIA, to get approval. yeah. Okay, thank you. Sure. Thank you, <laughs> thank you very much for your time.